think it was probably about two and a half weeks ago. Um, my days are kind of blurring together at this point. But I think it was about two and a half weeks ago. Um, I went down to Salt Lake to have lunch with a couple of my girlfriends. They've been friends of mine for at least 20 years now. And it was three weeks ago yesterday that we put my dad on hospice. And so I was going to have lunch with my friends before I went to my mom and dad's house to spend some time with my mom and my dad. And I was really looking forward to this lunch because they've been friends of mine for so long. I was really needing some of that comfort and that love that comes from having a friendship for 20 years. So we met at our usual place and um, when I got to that lunch, I realized those friends were needing as much comfort and love as I was. Um, one of them was going through a really difficult time with her teenage son, and uh, he was in a really hard, dark place. And the other one is my girlfriend who had a lung transplant five years ago, and she was in a really tough place. And honestly, any time we go out to eat together with her, it's always a little bit of a struggle because her diet is very specialized and she can only eat certain things and certain amounts of things. And, you know, honestly, we looked normal. We'd done our hair and makeup. We were out to lunch, so we looked like three ladies going to lunch. And our waitress had an attitude. She, uh, she honestly seemed pretty bugged by everything that we asked or requested and a little bit put out by the amount of time we were spending there. And I was sitting there in the booth, and the thought that started to roll through my mind was, gosh, if only she knew what the three of us were walking through right now. If only she understood that every person has a story. Every person is walking through something. And then God, in his really loving way, tapped me on the heart and said, Yeah, Crystal, everybody does have a story, including your waitress. And pride and humility collided for me right in that moment. Will you guys pray with me? Lord, um, we just thank you for this day. We uh, were so excited um, for what you're going to do in each of our lives today. We come expectant. We come ready. Um, arms wide open, hearts wide open, Lord. Um, ready to receive what you would have for each of us today. God, I specifically ask that I just walk in obedience. You know that I've got nothing to give today, emotionally, mentally, and physically. So I am just empty for you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. My name is Crystal Zayden. For those of you that may not know me, um, I work with women's ministry here at Crossroads. I'm also honored to be a part of our communication team. And I'm really excited to wrap up our five-part series called H2O, where we've been exploring how God uses water to meet the needs and teach and develop disciples in the Bible. And this has been a five-part series. Uh, if you haven't been here for all of them, I encourage you to go back on our website and watch them because they've been powerful. But honestly, this could have been a 25-part series when we look at all the ways that God uses water in the Bible to teach us things. So today we're going to be exploring a side of Jesus that maybe we're not quite as comfortable with as we are with other sides of him. So in the last five parts, we've looked at the miracle of Jesus and how he turned water into wine. And gosh... We love that side of Jesus, right? The miracle side. We looked at this um, story where Peter got out of the boat 
where God called him out of his comfort zone and he walked on water. We love that, right? We looked at baptism and the empowerment of Holy Spirit and how beautiful that is and that we're never alone with Holy Spirit. And then we looked at the story where we thought Jesus was napping in the boat. And then what did he do? He commanded the wind and the waves. And gosh, we love a God that commands the wind and the waves. Those. We love a God that raises people from the dead. We love that God. But today, we're going to look at Jesus and his humility. And that one isn't quite as comfortable to us. But as we're about to see in the story that we're going to look at, without humility, we can't be like Jesus because it's humility that gives us the ability to be like Jesus. It's humility that gives us the ability to be like Jesus. So we're going to turn in John 13, and we're going to read about this incredible evening. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. If not, it's going to be up on the screen. John 13, 1 through 3. Jesus knew on the evening of Passover day that it would be his last night on earth before returning to his father. During supper, the devil had already suggested to Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, that this was the night to carry out his plan to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. And how he loved his disciples. So he got up from the supper table. He took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his loins, and poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel he had around him. When he came to Simon Peter, Peter said, Master, you shouldn't be washing our feet like this. And Jesus replied, You don't understand now why I'm doing it, but someday you will. No, Peter protested, you shall never wash my feet. But if I don't, you can't be my partner, Jesus replied. Simon Peter exclaimed, then wash my hands and my head as well, not just my feet. And Jesus replied, one who is bathed all over needs only to have his feet washed to be entirely clean. Now you are clean, but that isn't true of everyone here. For Jesus knew who would, who would betray him. That is what he meant when he said, not all of you are clean. After washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, do you understand what I was doing? You call me master and Lord, and you do well to say it, for it is true. And since I, the Lord and teacher, have washed your feet... You ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. How true it is that a servant is not greater than his master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends him. You know these things. Now do them. That is the path to blessing. As a Jesus follower, I am constantly looking at his words, his actions, his ways, and trying to discover what he's trying to say to me, what he's trying to teach me through his word. And the big lesson in this story is humility. Webster defines humility as the freedom of pride and arrogance. Now, whether you here count yourself as a Jesus follower or not, I think we all can agree that the world needs more humility. 
I think humility is honestly one of the, mis one of the most misunderstood words of our time and it's a dying quality in our world. But as I said before, it is humility that gives us the ability to be like Jesus. You see, the world would try and convince us that humble means weak or cowardly or insecure. And in fact, it's quite the opposite. Humility is strength, it's confidence, it's courage. It's knowing that you're never the smartest person in the room. It's understanding that you have something to learn from every person that crosses your path. It's being quick to forgive and quick to ask for forgiveness. It's recognizing that you have an abundance of gifts and talents that God has given you, that you have a full bounty and therefore, there's never a reason to compare yourself to anybody else. Because comparison, honestly, will cause you to step into pride and not humility. C.S. Lewis put it beautifully when he said, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. We're living in a world where this is neither taught or modeled for us. Think of our politicians, of our leaders, of our actors, musicians, any person that's up in front of us on a daily basis. Can you imagine a political debate where one of the politicians actually gave the other politician an opportunity to answer a question completely? And then at the end said, what an awesome point. That was great. I don't think I've ever seen that in my life. I really don't. We are living in 2018, a selfie-driven world. The world on a daily basis is encouraging us to think of me, myself, and I only. And the honesty of that situation, you guys, is it's killing us. It's literally killing us. I read an article yesterday that talked about the fact that despair in our world is in a 40% increase. Despair. Can you even imagine? Anxiety, depression, and suicide are at an all-time high. When I was working on my message, I thought, I'm just going to Google it just to see. So I googled selfishness, social media, anxiety, and depression. In one swoop, 14 pages pulled up. Not 14 articles, 14 pages. Using social media platforms linked with depression and anxiety. Why Instagram is the worst social media for mental health ever. Research links heavy Facebook and social media usage to depression and anxiety. Social media causes depression and anxiety. How does social media cause depression? The link between social media and depression. Social media depression definition. April 30th, 2016, researchers at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine recently conducted a study about the effects of social media habits and the moods of users. The research confirmed and determined the more time we use social media, the more likely we are to be depressed. I'm not giving this message to suggest that you get rid of social media. I'm just stating that that is one conduit in our world that we're living in that leads us to continually focus on ourselves, period. That's just one conduit in the world. Our world is like a rushing river, I mean rushing, saying me, 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 me. So for us to be different, which as Jesus followers, we're called to be different and not be of the world, we are going to have to swim with exhausted arms upstream if we're going to fight it. But you know what? 
God thinks we can do it. He believes we can. Because not one of us in this room is here in Crossroads in 2018 by accident. He has a divine plan and a purpose for each of us. And he's counting on us to help make the shift in this culture. Because if it's not us, who is it? Who's it going to be? And I don't, I for one don't want us to die of this disease of self. This is going to mean focusing on others and practicing servant leadership. You see, true leaders always aim to serve rather than be served. And sometimes what causes us to stray from that path is we're like, I feel like I need to be tough. But confidence and humility show a quiet strength and toughness that people around you recognize. Think of Mother Teresa. Nobody thought she was weak. She's one of the toughest people we've ever seen. And what did she do? She gave her life away every single day, serving with humility. In Mark 10, 45, it says, For even the Son of Man did not come to serve, or to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And he gave that ransom for each one of those disciples, even though he knew Peter would betray him three times, and Judas would give him away to die on the cross for you and for me. Author John Gordon says, you can be both confident and humble. Humble is knowing there is a God and it's not you. Confident, knowing you were made in God's image and he has a plan for your life. So a good place to start is by asking yourself, where and when are you least humble? Is it when you make that game-winning basket? Is it when your child performs or behaves better than other children around you? Is it when you get the promotion that everybody else wanted? Is it when you get behind the wheel of a car? When you visit a friend's house and the thought crosses your mind, their house is pretty modest compared to mine. You see, pride is like a dark smoke that can seep into your heart if you don't monitor it. And it comes in at the craziest times, especially when you find yourself comparing. I think it was 1999. I was in my first marriage. I think Nathan was probably two or three years old at the time. Um, I was sitting in church, of all places. And my ex-husband and I had been going to therapy regularly, fighting for our marriage. And I was looking around the room, and I remember, you know, it was a smaller church, so I knew almost every single person there pretty well. And I knew there was a couple other people in that room that were having problems in their marriage. And I remember they were think, sitting there, tilting my head, thinking, at least we're fighting for our marriage. At least. That's a really good phrase that we like to use a lot. At least my kid doesn't do that. At least I don't allow my kids to watch PG-13 movies. At least we've been doing this. At least I didn't go there. At least I've never done drugs or alcohol. At least. It's a dark smoke. And one we can only combat by taking captive every thought that comes into our heart and into our mind. We can find ourselves exalting ourselves in words or actions before we know it. In Luke 14, 11, Jesus says, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled 
and, then, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Let's be honest. Who really wants to be around the cocky, conceited, know-it-all friend? They're, right? They're not really that fun to be around. Honestly, they're pretty painful to be around. But I think some of us are also worried we won't be heard if we're humble. And the truth is that humility always has the loudest voice in the room. We are drawn to it, we recognize it, and we want to be around it. Think about Martin Luther King Jr. and Gandhi, two of the most quoted people of all time. And they were humble to the core. We love humility. Jesus dripped with humility from the time he came to this earth. Crowds surrounded him everywhere he went. He was absolutely magnetic with humility. And you realize that you're never going to lose anything by being humble. You'll never lose a friendship or a relationship when you walk with humility. The only thing you stand to lose is pride. Pride, however, will steal everything from you if you're not careful. Think of a time when you absolutely stiffened your spine and refused to apologize to somebody you care the very most about. If you don't humble yourself in a relationship, you stand to lose days, weeks, or months of building something beautiful together. But when you humble yourself and say you're sorry, oh, the intimacy that can come from that situation is powerful. <clears throat> Jesus washed 12 men's feet that night. Some were stinkier than others, right? One of the most fascinating things to me about that story is that he washed 12 men's feet and he knew one would betray him. But none of the other disciples knew who it was. He knew. Judas had been stealing already. He knew what was going to happen, but none of the other disciples knew. Do you know why? He never treated Judas any differently. You know how someone betrays us or we know something about him, so we kind of start to give him a little bit of the cold shoulder. Maybe we're a little put out by them. So people know. People in your friend group know. They know something's going on. Not one of the disciples knew because Jesus loved him and treated him and served him the same as he did all the others. How big of a challenge is that for us, you guys? I mean, I can wash maybe a stranger's feet, but knowing my kid might smart off to me tomorrow or my husband might say something that bugs me, and I need to wash his feet, that's challenging. Servant leadership and humility starts with those people that God has put in our lives. It starts with the need to humble ourselves. Do you think the people around you would say at least some of the time, you look and sound stubborn, proud, even arrogant? Do you gravitate automatically to an agenda that features your comfort, your wants, your pleasures? What does foot washing look like in your home? There's that phrase, what goes on behind closed doors? I think we need to start behind our closed doors because it can be pretty easy for me to start with a stranger, but much harder 
to start with the people and the feet that God has specifically put in my life. I think of Jesus that night. You know, you think of the king and the queen of England and how distant and how far they are and how people just do anything to get a glance at them. And our king, our Lord, our savior, bends down with a bowl of water and he grabs a towel And yeah, he washed those disciples' feet, but he washes our feet. That's how much he loves us. You know, I I told you about my dad being on hospice. So it's three weeks yesterday. And right now, um, yesterday I was there He's not opening his eyes anymore um, or talking anymore. But um, my mom, she uh, texted me this morning and said, I'm going to put the message up to your dad's ear because maybe he wants to hear his baby talk one more time before he goes. Um, My parents are the ultimate example of humility. I don't think my dad's ever said a prideful word in his life. And yet, he's the most incredibly generous, beautiful man um, that there's ever been. And people were drawn to him. My sister and my friends would be like, is your dad going to make us a sandwich after school? You know, because he just was loving and generous. I, I think our house had someone living in it on and off my whole life. Cousins, aunts, uncles, whoever needed somewhere, our home was open. So my dad leaves this legacy of humility and love and generosity. And I think of this three weeks and the amount of humility we've experienced. I think of the hospice workers coming in, lovingly listening to my mom tell every story and letting her just talk. I think of sweet Eva, who has bathed my dad every day for the last three weeks, lovingly stroking him, shaving him, lotioning him. I think of my friends that have known that we're in the middle of moving into a new home next week who have come over for an hour or two whenever they can to pack a box, to deliver a meal to my mom and my aunt. I think of my aunt who's taken three weeks out of her life to be with my mom every single day. I think of my sweet dad, who can barely talk. And my mom says, it's Eva's birthday, Larry. And he said, go get my bag of jewelry. You see, my dad made jewelry. And he picked out two pieces to give her for her birthday. I think of the nine men that showed up to our house yesterday to help my husband unload our garage and move it to the next house, which enabled me to be able to go down and spend the evening with my mom. I think of my dad, barely able to talk, and I'm laying in the bed rubbing his head, and Nathan stands up to walk across the room and he says, Nate. And Nate said, yeah, Papa. And he said, when I go, will you do my service? Nate said, I'd be honored too, Papa. I'd be honored. I 
I think of my family singing songs of joy because we know where my dad's going. And we have love and we have humility and compassion because that's the legacy he wanted to leave and he has left. My dad never lived all about himself. It was always, what can I do for others? That's the legacy Jesus wants us to leave. And you guys, our life here is that long. Maybe you need to apologize to somebody in your life. I suggest you do it before it's too late. There's people that never made amends that last 10 to 15 years with my dad. Wow, that's a shame. Maybe you need to make friends with that person at work or school that you see sitting alone all the time. And they just need somebody, you guys. They're not weird. They just need a friend. Maybe you need to delete social media apps from your phone so you're not constantly comparing your life. Then you can start focusing on the life that's right in front of your face and the people that God's put in your path right there. Who's God put in your life? What can you do to serve them despite how hard they are to be served? And how different they may be from you? I want to encourage you that you've got an opportunity to humble yourself and to serve and to love people every day. That's a life worth living. That's the reason God commanded us in that story in John. He didn't say, I suggest, or maybe if you feel like it. He said, I command you. Do as I did. He washed Judas's feet. Even though, can you imagine how that felt? To know Judas was going to betray him. And he was going to die for you and you and you, and me. And he got down on his knees and washed his feet. He believes we can do it. I believe we can, and I want to be like Jesus more than anything. Will you guys pray with me? Maybe you're not familiar with this Jesus I've been talking about today. Maybe you've never actually surrendered or given your life to him. Maybe you've never even heard him talked about in the manner we talked about him today. That close, personal Jesus that wants to wash your feet and love you. With all heads bowed and eyes closed, closed if that's you, I, I would just love to pray with you and agree with you. If you just want to lift your hand, um, it, only me looking right now. If that's you, I would love to pray with you today. For the rest of you, if you would like to raise your hand, if you feel like this humility thing is something that God is calling you deeper into, go ahead and raise your hand with all of us. Yeah, I want to be more humble. I want to walk in humility. Yeah. Lord, I, I just, you see all these hands, God. My hands raised too, Lord. Uh, Lord, thank you for being the example. Thank you for teaching us. Thank you for laying down your life for us, God. Thank you for showing us there's a different way than that painful awful, me, 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 I, I, I way that the world wants us to walk, Lord. Help us to be 
all about others. Help us to lay down our gifts and our talents that you've given us to serve others, Lord. Help us to recognize the bounty you have given us and to realize that we can glorify you in serving and loving your people, Lord, no matter how hard, no matter if they betray us, no matter if we um, are hurt, God, that we can serve them, we can love them, and we can humble ourselves, God. I pray that we walk out of here different than we walked in today. And Lord, we love you so much. In your name we pray. Amen.